gathered thy children together, as a hen doth gather her brood under her wings, and you would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. And verily I say unto you, you shall not, and this is the part I want to focus on to start our lesson, you shall not see me until the time come when you shall say, Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. You see, they were at a spot in their life where they did not see the value of having the Messiah. They didn't see the need. They didn't see what it benefited them. And this is typically what it is to hear the gospel while you are comfortable living in sin or when you're in compromise. Understand that people who are living the life of a sinner oftentimes do not want to hear the message. They don't want to appreciate, as it were, the man of God or the woman of God, the person who is being faithful to God until a crisis arrives. And that's what Jesus was saying. He said, you will not see me again until you will be willing to say, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. This is a total attitude change that will be brought about, no doubt, by circumstances uh, and a change of mind and a change of heart, a change of disposition on the part of those that would know the Lord. And I just wanted to lay that little mini foundation before we move on. In 1 Corinthians 4, verse 1 and 2, we read these words. Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ, the stewards of the mysteries of God. Now, he's telling you what we're the steward of, primarily. Okay? We're the stewards of the mysteries of God. And the mysteries of God is entailed in the gospel. Of Jesus Christ. Moreover, Paul continuing, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. God had entrusted to Paul the Apostle great mysteries that had been kept hidden from the very foundation of the world. They were mysteries that ultimately would need to be placed into the hands of faithful men. And we talked about this last week faithful because of the fact that the message was not going to ultimately be well received among the people. They wouldn't want to hear it, in other words. Some of the people would want to hear a message perhaps that was more along a legalistic line. They would want to hear a message that was more law-based. And then there were other people that perhaps would think that Paul's message was too strict or it was a message that was, was, was too high and lofty and unattainable. But nevertheless, when the Lord called him and gave him, began to give him these mysteries, one of the first things he told him was, he said, I must show him the things that he must suffer for my name's sake. Paul's life was going to be characterized by suffering and by resistance. He was going to be beaten with rods. He was going to be stoned. He was going to be in many perils that he, he outlines in his writings. He was going to be led over the, over the wall in a basket at one point, fleeing the city. Why? Because of the mysteries that he had been entrusted with. This was a message that brought tremendous persecution. And the Lord needed to place that message into the hand of a faithful man. A man that was going to declare what God was saying, no matter how hot it got in the kitchen. How many of you know what I'm talking about? No matter how popular he was going to be, no matter how many things he had to suffer for the cause of that message, no matter how much loss that he would have to suffer for the cause of that message, he needed to place it into the hands of a faithful man that would bring about what the Lord was saying in spite of anything that would ultimately happen. This is what it is to be a faithful steward. And Paul said, it is required of a steward that they be found faithful. 1 Corinthians 4, Paul is being examined and questioned of people. They're asking him lots of questions. And one of the things he lets them know is, I'm not so much worried about what people think. 
I'm concerned about what ultimately God thinks because I am going to have to give an account for my stewardship of these mysteries whether I was faithful with these mysteries or not and I think that's an important point point. and secondarily I want to talk also from the book of Zechariah chapter 4 and Zechariah writing says these words then he answered and spoke unto me or spake unto me saying this is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel or Zerubbabel some have pronounced it saying not by might nor by power but by my spirit saith the Lord of hosts now understand that Zerubbabel was in charge of rebuilding the temple in Jerusalem he was the steward of this great project the temple of course had been destroyed all the artifacts of the temple had been carried away to Babylon and he was in charge of coming back and rebuilding what would become to be known the second temple in Zechariah 4 and 6 God was revealing to Zerubbabel a great mystery the temple project that he was overseeing was not going to be built with worldly means of might or power that is strength or money or worldly influence or any of these things like the buildings in Babylon were built by see when you want to get a project done in the world oftentimes you need to know someone especially in government and you can pu push through these projects in government and you can get things done you can get buildings built you can get projects done but God was saying to Zerubbabel he said that's not how my temple is going to be rebuilt my temple is going to be built not by might nor by power but by my spirit saith the Lord of hosts this was going to be a work that God had empowered from start to finish the name Zerubbabel means born in Babylon it means the seed of Babylon or it could mean the sons of Babylon truly Zerubbabel may have been born of Babylon but God's temple was going to be built of his spirit of course you can already see this is a picture of the church ultimately God's temple was going to be born of his Holy Spirit Truly, Zerubbabel was born of Babylon. We must understand this is a tremendous truth. It's not going to be worldly means, worldly might, worldly monies, all these types of ideologies that ultimately build the kingdom of God. And often when we quote this passage, not by might nor by power, we don't really realize the context of what's being said. What he's saying is, my temple is not going to be built by these other worldly means as was the rest of this world in this case Babylon but they are going to be built under the power and influence of the Holy Spirit the vision that Zerubbabel had was he had seen if you read through chapter 4 he saw a great golden candlestick and this candlestick had seven branches with seven tubes that went up to a top base up at the top and up to that there were also two tubes that ran out and on each side of this candlestick was an olive tree there was an olive tree that would bring its oil into this tube and then ultimately into this vial and there was the same happening on this side and then from that vial it would feed each one of the branches of this tremendous candlestick that was made out of solid gold which served to be a tremendous light and in my mind ultimately was a picture of the church the church of Jesus Christ and this is the backdrop of what Zerubbabel was being shown the angel would ask him do you see this and he would say yes but he didn't understand what he was seeing so this was a new revelation to Zerubbabel in other words he came into this building of the temple with some preconceived ideas that God needed to change he needed to get him thinking in a spiritual frame when it came to doing his work and he did it through this tremendous revelation Zerubbabel means a son of Babel 